I don't know the name of some of the things she gave to me. Uh, maybe when I get home, I'll ask her what they were. But I'm glad to be able to do this. And so I have a copy of my sermon that I left for her to um, follow me. And just in case I can't finish, she'll have to finish it. So you know the reason the computer is there now. <laughs> also, about just over a week ago, for those who cannot see, I'm in sneakers or of some sort, because a week or so ago, I, I wasn't angry with my wife, but I, I kicked a chair. <laughs> and um, I've been able to comfortably wear a pair of shoes since then, so. But I'm glad to be in the courts of the Lord, and I'm glad to be able to speak his word that he has given. And the title is, Let No One Steal Your Joy. Did I let the devil steal my joy? He tried with the, with the toe. I'm in sneakers, and I'm comfortable, because I wouldn't be able to stand here for <coughs> the hour and a half that I'll be standing here today. <laughs> and as for the breathing, I thank the Lord. I'm not going to let the devil steal my joy today. Shall we pray? Because I have a long way to go. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your love, your truth. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us for today and to bless. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Let no one steal your joy. Today we notice that one of the missing ingredients of, in the lives of many people is joy. And unfortunately, this missing ingredient of joy that the world is experiencing, it is in the church we are experiencing the same thing. No joy. We come to church with a long face, so serious. But I believe the church is a place where we should be joyful. We come to church to have a good time. Amen? We come to church to have a good time. And because there are so many individuals who are not happy, they, they do not have the joy that they should possess. They turn to drugs. That shows us that money cannot make one happy. Or money does not give one the joy that they should have in their heart. Because if money could do it, we would not have so many rich folk doing drugs. They say that religion is the poor man's opium. But if religion, and I, I want to, instead of saying religion, <clears throat> I want to say if Christianity, and when I say Christianity, I'm not talking about the religion of Christianity. I'm talking about those who are followers of Jesus Christ. Because... <clears throat> Where did I leave my water? There's a big difference between being a Christian 
as a religion and a Christian, thank you very much, sir, and a Christian as a follower of Jesus Christ. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we ought to be Christians that are <coughs> followers of Jesus Christ. Not a follower of a religion, the religion of Christianity. So because the rich, <coughs> they find no joy whatsoever in their bank account, in their Bugatti car, in their Mercedes Benz, and all these fancy exotic cars and the mansions in which they live, they find no joy in it, so they turn to drugs. But of course, as Seventh-day Adventist Christian, we cannot do that. We must find our joy from somewhere else. And we can find our joy in one person. Do you, could you guess who that person is? None other than Jesus Christ himself. So we live in a society where many people are desperately consumed with looking for happiness and pursuing happiness, but have come up empty every time because true joy is lacking. They cannot find true joy. They cannot find the happiness that they seek. Joy is something that a few people long for. Is that statement correct? Joy is something that a few people long for. Is that right? How many people long for joy? Everyone. The criminal, he longs for joy. The Christian longs for joy. We all <coughs> long for joy. It is something that, <coughs> for many, they find it so elusive. It is difficult to grab joy and to hold it. Billy Sunday, who was an evangelist, a great preacher of righteousness. He once said that if you have no joy in your religion, there is a leak somewhere in your Christianity. So if you're coming to church <clears throat> every Sabbath, and you can find no joy in your heart, you need to check for that leak that is in your um, Christianity. And by the way, may I put um, Elder Giscom on notice that you may have to do the appeal. <coughs> Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22 tells us, but the fruit of the Spirit is, what is the second one? What is the first one? And the second is joy. And the next one is peace. And the next, long-suffering, then kindness, then goodness. So if joy wasn't that important, it would not rank so high when Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is. And I want you to observe also that it is not the fruits of the Spirit so that you could say, oh, I, I have orange and I don't need apple. All of these combined, <coughs> combined together make the fruit of the Spirit. That means Every Christian person should have 
all of these segments of the fruit to have a whole fruit. So joy is a deep and abiding inner rejoicing which was promised to those who abide in Jesus Christ and obey his commandments. There are some people who believe that to be a Christian, all that you have to do is to call on the name of Jesus Christ. You go to dance Saturday night and you turn up for church Sunday morning. You are a good Christian. I remember <coughs> I was canvassing, called Porting, selling Adventist books, in the city of Richmond, California. After finishing seminary and um, I went to California and I was calling the conference so often that they said, um, go canvassing until something opens. And so I was <coughs> canvassing and what we would do on Sunday morning, we would go in the Baptist Church, the Church of God Church, any church that will accept us, we would go in to those churches and we would, the, the pastor would give us the opportunity from his pulpit to advertise Seventh-day Adventist books. And after we advertised in service like this, what we would do at the end of the service, we would go to the door and um, collect the cards that we have given out. And during the week, we go selling books. So that is <coughs> what we used to do. So some believe that you just have to accept Jesus and there's nothing more to do about it. And I recall going to one church and after service was over and we went outside, this guy, right there in the public, he just pulled out his cigarette, got his lighter and was puffing right there, just came out of church. As a matter of fact, <coughs> I saw a, a video recently in Rome, it happened, at the Vatican, that they were waiting for the Pope, and one of the priests, while waiting, was there puffing away. One of the priests was there puffing away. John chapter 15, verses 10 through 11 tells us, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in what? My love, just as I have done what? Kept my Father's commandments, and I do what? Abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Now, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a garage make you an automobile. And so, it takes a little more than just coming to church to be a Christian. It takes a little more than just coming to church to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Because if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, we would expect that you will be obedient to the Word of God. And some individuals, well, they, they think that um, Ten Commandments, I don't do this. Number one, I don't do that. Number two, I don't do that. Number three, number four, I don't do. Number five... So I am good. I am a good Seventh-day Adventist. But being a good Seventh-day Adventist goes beyond just ticking off the ten. It is everything that the Lord says. 
Remember when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness? What did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. It is written. If Jesus had not studied the word, if Jesus had not read the word, Jesus could not tell the devil it is written. How would he know? So we have to study the word of God. So I thought of the word full, that your joy may be full. And I looked at the word full. It is a simple word that everyone understands. But I wanted to have a fuller understanding of the word full. And I was surprised to see all these words popped up, replete, satisfied, satiated, having enough, all-inclusive, all-encompassing, all-embracing. So Jesus is here telling us that your joy may be full, that your joy may be satiated, that your joy will be all-inclusive, <clears throat> that your joy will be all-embracing. That is what we need, every one of us as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. So joy is a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. And it does not depend on the circumstances around us. If it were dependent on the circumstances around us, one of the saddest person, uh, persons around would be my head girl in high school. Sister Claudette. She was actually my head girl in high school, but every time I say that she uh, <clears throat> gets at me because she wants everyone to know that we are not in the same age category. <laughs> but what happened? <laughs> My first year in school was her last year. And I went to high school a little late. I was about 17 years old when I went to high school. So we are not actually in the same age category. Have I made it clear? Yes, sir. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yes. So it does not depend on our circumstances because if it had depended on our circumstances, she would be very sad, very unhappy because she wants to run like a certain sister in red. I'm not going to call anybody's name today. A certain sister in red top. She wants to run like that person. But she's happy. Can we say that Sister Claudette is a happy person? Yes, she is. Because her joy is not dependent on being able to walk. Her joy is not dependent on being able to do things with her two hands. Her joy is dependent on Jesus Christ. Amen. And beloved, for each and every one of us, we need to depend on Jesus Christ for our joy. Amen. And thanks for all the work you did on Thursday. It was great. Often we have conflicts with others that rob us of our joy just because we fail to show humility. Humility is something that 
many people do not desire. You know, it is good to have a healthy self-esteem. It is easier to get along with people who have a healthy self-esteem. Is that right? Easier, much easier. There's less misunderstandings. You do not have to be going back to the person and apologizing and explaining what you meant. You didn't mean that, you meant this. And this is what you have to do when you're dealing with someone with a low esteem, self-esteem. But if a person has a healthy self-esteem, they will understand when you speak. And there will be less conflict. You see, when a person has a low self-esteem, they interpret everything you say in the light of what they think about themselves. So they think that you are affirming that they're not smart or that they are not up to the challenge or whatever the particular case may be. So when we think too highly about ourselves, now there is a big difference between a healthy self-esteem, or let me start at the bottom, Big difference between low self-esteem, healthy self-esteem, and when you over-esteem. When you think that you're more important than you really are. That's another difficult person to deal with. And you may allow that person sometimes to steal your joy. But do not allow anyone with low self-esteem or too high a self-esteem to steal your joy because the devil is set to steal whatever good that you have. And so when someone is thinking too highly about themselves, or too low about themselves, it is easy to become very petty. It is easy to become very trivial and very trifling, both with other members of the church and in their own family. You think of your opinions as more important than they really are, and more important than everybody else's. We become easily offended by others. If you go around thinking too highly of yourself, you will miss out on the joy that comes with having a humble attitude. When we have the kind of humility that ought to characterize every believer, then we will do as Paul instructs us to do in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. To be kindly and the next word is what? To be kindly, somebody, I heard someone say. To be kindly what? A little louder. To be kindly, affectionate, one to the other, with what? Brotherly love, sisterly too, in honor, giving preference to one another. And when we have 
that, when we have accomplished that, we'll strive to outdo each other in showing love, respect, and honor. When you give preference to others instead of selfishly demanding your own way or your rights, it leads to the satisfaction of inner peace. And when you have inner peace, you will have joy in Jesus Christ. If you have been wondering why you have been so sad, why you're just not happy, just take a stock of self, and you may just discover why. I had a friend, still a friend, that we used to go to summer camp together. And um, I'm thinking in terms of the Romans chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, let Love be without hypocrisy, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. So I have this friend, we used to go to summer camp together. We entered college together, Western is College, uh, now Northern Caribbean University. We were hired by the same school to teach while we were in college. We were hired by the same conference as intern pastors. We turned up for the pastoral assignment together in the same car. And finally, we both left Jamaica together to Canada, then to Andrews University. And during our pastoral internship, I was speaking with my senior pastor. I don't know if you know him, Pastor Gunter, West Conference, Pastor Gunter. He was my senior pastor. And one day talking, we were talking, and I said that if there were a position that turned up and we both, my friend and myself, we both were being considered for that position, I would give preference to him. Pastor Gunter said to me, that's not the way it works in ministry. You don't give up an opportunity to somebody else. But what does the scripture say? The scriptures say to honor and prefer the other person above yourself. And even until now, I would do it. By the way, now he is the president of one of the New York conferences. I would do it now. And if you believe that I'm not telling the truth, I am the uh, men's ministry leader. If they should give it to someone else right now, I said, go take it, brother. You go take it. <laughs> oh, by the way, um, gentlemen, all male, remember, I need to speak with you immediately after the service, right over here. Mother's Day coming up, and we have to finalize our plans. So I still believe that until now to honor and prefer my brother above myself. Um, some perhaps listening to me right now, don't, you don't see that. You don't see yourself doing that. But practice humility in your relationship and you experience that inner joy that others 
are not capable of understanding. Once an author said, humility is something we should constantly pray for, but we should never thank God that we have it. Sounds strange. Humility is some, you, you don't pray, oh, thank you, God, that I am so humble. That is an announcement that you are not humble. Pharisee. So joy is something that we never boast about that we have. Let others see the joy that is within us. Once there was a man who, he was traveling somewhere, went up to the airline counter, and he demanded that he should be served right then. But the attendant was attending to somebody else. So he asked the question, do you know who I am? She said, no, sir. And she took up the mic for the loudspeaker and she said, there is a man who doesn't know who he is. <laughs> Will someone please help him? We need to be humble. Amen? Amen? We need a humble attitude if we are Christians. It doesn't mean, though, that we're always going to be bubbly and on top of the world. Remember Elisha, Elijah? When Elijah had just killed four, uh, 450 false prophets, he was <coughs> one of the most successful prophets. And when he heard that a woman said, tomorrow by this time you're going to be like one of them, he started to run. And he ran, and he ran, and he ran, and then finally, exhausted, he stopped under a juniper tree, a broom tree, and he said, Lord, take my life. Why? A woman said something I didn't like. <laughs> of course, all of us men who have been married, um, what was my sermon about again? Sorry. Yes. But let us take a look at David. And some of us, I believe, we were so shocked when we started to read the psalm in detail and saw some of the things that David said to do with his enemies. Knock their teeth out, Lord. That's violence. But tell you what, beloved. We can talk with the Lord. We can tell the Lord how we feel. And he understands. He understands. He's a good God. Because he understands our feeling. He didn't hold David... He didn't hold it against David for what David had said. But at the end of the day, David put everything in the hand of the Lord. And David said, you know, I would rather be in the house of the Lord than anywhere else. 
because in the house of the Lord he was happy. Can anyone tell me when did I start? I just need to know when do I start? 12 0 <laughs> Did you have reason to check when I started? What, do I have a reputation that is not? <laughs> joy is a gift of God. When you have joy in your heart, you have God's gift in your heart. And it is also a response to the gift of God. So two things in one here. It is God's gift to you to be happy, to be joyful. And at the same time, it is your response to the gift that God has given to you. Joy comes to us when we are aware of God's grace and God's favor. And there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is dependent on what is going on. Happiness is if the preacher preached a short sermon and let you out before um, 1.30, you're happy. But when the preacher keeps you until 2 o'clock today, that happiness that you had is gone. Joy is something more permanent. It comes to stay. Sin promises joy, but sin cannot deliver joy. True joy is only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gives joy in the heart. Happiness depends on what happens. Joy depends on our relationship with the Lord. Happiness depends on circumstances. When circumstances change, then happiness is gone with the wind. But Jesus never changes. Happiness is like the thermometer. It only registers the conditions. Joy is the thermostat. You set the control for the conditions that you want. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say what? Rejoice. If it were not important, Paul wouldn't have said it twice. So it is important for us to rejoice. It is important for us to have joy in our hearts. Happiness is uh, an emotion usually directly related to current circumstances. So when the circumstances are good and going in the right direction, there is happiness. But on the other hand, when things break, when things get old, uh, let me just pause there because sometimes, you know, many individuals marry a young wife I didn't intend to step on your toes. <laughs> when a person may marry a young wife and eventually even a car gets old after a while, isn't it? So after a while the wife gets old and they think that they have to get another one now. It's time to trade in. Happiness is gone. Trading time. 
when they are disappointed, when we do not get what we want, when things go north instead of south, when we feel sad and unhappy, things change. But with joy, with Jesus Christ in the heart, there is joy. There is peace. But as I said earlier, it doesn't mean that all the time you're going to be smiling. Remember Jesus? He was very upset at times, righteous indignation. When he went into the temple and he saw all that was happening in the temple, he became angry and he did something about it. When Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus was very sad. And the Bible tells us, Jesus wept. Jesus also wept over Jerusalem. When he saw the condition of Jerusalem, Jesus wept. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweated drops of blood. What we do have is the promise of joy. That's what Jesus is offering. The promise of joy. So let us not dwell on our dissatisfactions nor our anxieties, nor on our unhappiness and difficulties or those things that you allow to rob you of your contentment. But look to Jesus for the joy that he gives. Another way of experiencing joy in the Christian life is through community. serving in the food pantry. You know, I, I, I serve in the food pantry, as many of you know, and Elder Gibran, <coughs> one of the things that I like about the food pantry is that we are a little family. It's a feeling, <coughs> the, the food pantry, when we come to serve, the food pantry is like a little family together. All those who serve in the food pantry, just raise your hand, please. Sister Joy, raise your hand. <laughs> Brother Ed, Brother Ed, oh, yeah? raise your hand. Yeah. But those of us who serve in the food pantry, it is like a little family. When we get together to serve the people, it is like a little family. Sister Philip, you didn't raise your hand, I didn't see it. It is like a little family together. Is that the way you feel too, Sister? Brother Duncan, when you serve the, it's a Sister Sterling, it's a special feeling because there is that special feeling of joy when we are in community with each other. The job fair on Thursday, not it's just a good feeling to know that we are striving to help other people. It gives joy in the heart and the health fear, um, Sister Elder, the health fear that is being planned. You know, we need a whole lot of folk to come. Up. Let's flood the place. You will be surprised the joy that comes to your heart when you serve others. And I, I want to let you know that I'm coming to an end in the next half an hour. <laughs> there are so many things that cause us unhappiness. But we thank God 
that we may find peace in Jesus Christ. If all that I've said today means anything to you, the peace of Jesus Christ in your heart, if it does mean anything to you, today I'm going to ask you to stand with me so that we can close soon. You know, once I heard that someone said, was asked, what part of the sermon did you like best? The person said, the benediction. <laughs> but beloved, we need the peace of God in our hearts. Amen. And when we have the peace of God in our hearts, we will also have joy. Amen. We will not be cross with each other. We will treat each other with love and kindness. We will be brotherly and sisterly to each other that we meet from day to day. And if you want this peace in your heart, if you want this joy that Jesus is giving, could you just raise your hand and say, Lord, give me that joy. Give me that peace so that that joy will abide in my heart always. Shall we pray? Father, <clears throat> we give you thanks. We thank you, Lord, that you have been with us. We thank you, Lord, first for the miracle so that I could stand here today and be able to talk. We thank you, Lord, that you are offering the peace and the joy in our hearts so that it will abide there forever. Father, when we have received this joy and this peace, may it shine on others so that they may enjoy it too. Amen. Bless us now, we pray. And Lord, as soon we shall leave this place of worship, we ask that you will help us to be a source of sunshine in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. So I have a few more minutes. I, before we do the um, closing, so. <laughs> my little cousin is here from Orlando. He sings well, and at this point, Darlan is going to come and sing for us, and then we have the closing. Happy Sabbath. direction 
You're the compass for my way. You're the firelight when nights so long and cold. In sadness, you are the laughter that shudders all my fears when I'm all alone. Your hand is there to hold. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my, my joy. All that's good and perfect, oh, come way down. Contentment, hope for all I do. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Oh, you are why I find pleasure in the simple things in life. The meadows and the streams, the voices of all my children, my family, and my home. You're the source and finish of my highest dreams. Whoa, Jesus, don't you know? You're the center of my, my, my joy. All the good and perfect, good Lord. Come way down, come way down from you. Yeah, you are. You're the heart of my, 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 my contentment, Lord. Hope for all, everything that I do. To the center of my joy. Oh, Jesus, you are to the center of my joy. You are everything, Lord, not just something, Lord. You are everything, oh Lord. to lunch when you go out the last turn left and you're invited to lunch that's all visitors and class number five that's my class sister Gibbert's class uh, brother um, Brooks class and also class number six you're invited to lunch and anybody else can come Stand with me for our closing hymn number 343. Thank you, Darlan, for blessing our souls with this song.
in line with the sermon that was preached today. Three, four, three. I will sing of my redeemer. benediction I would like to let you know that there will be Bible study class this afternoon at five o'clock what time did I say five, five o'clock so I'm hoping to find most of you if not all of you this afternoon at five o'clock please bow your heads for the benediction be joyful always pray without ceasing and give thanks to God in all circumstances for this is his will in Christ for you and me. May the Lord bless us and keep us. We thank you, Lord, for the food that you have just provided for us. We thank you and we pray that it will strengthen our bodies and us for your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Dismiss us, Lord, with blessings we pray, as from thy word.